Sargastiti pralaya hetu machintya shakti Vishveshvarang vidita vishvamananta murti Nirmukta bandhanama para sukham burashing Shri valabhang vimala bodhaganang namami I bow down to that pure divine consciousness, a shoreless ocean of happiness, which is all-pervading Vishnu, the beloved of Sri, the all-knowing Lord of the universe, assuming endless forms and yet ever free, having an inscrutable power to become the apparent cause of creation, maintenance, and dissolution of the universe. Yasya prasada dahameva vishnur mayeva sarvang parikalpitang cha itang vijana misadatma rupang tasyang gripadmang pranatos minityam. Again and again I prostrate at the feet of my guru by whose grace I have come to realize I am the all-pervading essence, Vishnu, alone, and that the world of multiplicity is all a superimposition upon myself. Tapatrayarkasang tapta Kaschidud vigna manasaha, Shamadisadhanair yukta, Sadgurum pariprichati. Scorched by the blazing sun of the three miseries, a student, dejected with the world and restless for release, having cultivated all the means of liberation, especially such virtues as self-control, etc., inquires from a noble teacher. Anaya sena yenas man mucheya bhava bandhanat Tanme Sankshipya Bhagavan Kevalam Kripaya Vada. O holy teacher, please explain to me briefly, by your grace and mercy alone, the means by which I may easily get liberated from the sorrows of this bondage to change. Namaste. So we're going to try something new. In this series, we're going to go into the Vakya Vritti. And uh, this is a work by Shankaracharya. Vakya refers to the Mahavakyas, the great sayings of the four Vedas. And in particular, thou art that, tattvamasi, meaning you are Brahman. And it also goes into, well, a lot of other stuff besides. But basically, these four verses set the context for the rest of the work. The first two verses are the invocation, and the second two verses set the dramatic background. So let's take a closer look at the invocation. I bow down to that pure divine consciousness, a shoreless ocean of happiness, which is all-pervading Vishnu, the beloved of Sri, the all-knowing Lord of the universe, assuming endless forms and yet ever free, having an inscrutable power to become the apparent cause of creation, maintenance, and dissolution of the universe.
Again and again I prostrate at the feet of my Guru, by whose grace I have come to realize I am the all-pervading essence, Vishnu, alone, and that the world of multiplicity is all a superimposition upon myself. So this is normal in the beginning of a scripture. First of all, to invoke the deity. And which deity is being invoked and how is very important because it sets the mood for the whole piece. So is he talking about Brahman? No. He's invoking Vishnu. Why? Because the people who are going to read this are not qualified for Upanishadic study. They're not ready to go off into the woods and surrender everything and then just immerse themselves in transcendental sound vibration. They're not ready for that. So what he's doing is telling a story about someone who is ready for that. It's an ingenious literary trick. But in other words, it's like the step-down transformer on the power pole at the end of your block. It steps down the transmission voltage, which is usually 440 or 880, three phase or four phase. And it steps it down to 220 for household use. And then in your house, you may have a further step down to 110. So in the same way, this high-powered Brahman or Advaita knowledge, this Vedanta knowledge, is being kind of diluted. Not really, but let's put it this way. There's a superimposition being made on it. Vishnu in Advaita philosophy is not the independent Lord of the universe, but he is an upadi that is projected, overlaid, or superimposed on Brahman. And this upadi is called Ishatvam. Ishatvam means the self-concept that I am the Lord. So Vishnu is operating under this assumption or this upadi Ishatvam, <clears throat> that I am the Lord of the universe and I am responsible. Uh, he has to believe the universe is real and he has to believe that he holds a very important functional post of superintending the creation via his expansion, Lord Brahma, then personally taking over the maintenance by the power of his Shakti, Shri, who is all wealth and glamour. And then stepping out of the way and letting Rudra destroy the universe at the end. You know, still ostensibly in control, but not really. <laughs> but anyway, this is Vishnu. So what's the thing about Vishnu that's so valuable? Well, he's everything. Jagrat, you see? So by identifying with Vishnu, one becomes realized over the Jagrat, the external energy, the illusory energy of objects in the world. So this is the aim, this is the goal, this is the divine purpose of this literary work. And now he's going to tell the story in a capsule in the second verse. Again and again, I prostrate at the feet of my guru, by whose grace I have come to realize I am the all-pervading essence, Vishnu, alone, and that the world of multiplicity is all a superimposition on myself. He's telling his own story because he went to a guru like this, and he got enlightenment like this. And so now he's going to retell in the form 
of sort of an autobiographical sketch of this disciple, his own experience with his guru and how he realized the Advaita, how he realized Brahman. So then in the next two shlokas, the story begins and it sets the context, the tone, and the characters of the people who will be speaking for the whole rest of the book. Scorched by the blazing sun of the three miseries, a student, dejected with the world and restless for release, having cultivated all the means of liberation, especially such virtues as self-control, etc., inquires from a noble teacher, O holy teacher, please explain to me briefly, by your grace and mercy alone, the means by which I may easily get liberated from the sorrows of this bondage to change. Extremely significant question. So basically, first he approaches this teacher. Why? He's scorched by the blazing sun of the three miseries. The sun in Vedic astrology is considered an inauspicious planet because it is the marker of time. Day by day, the sun takes away our duration of life. So he is considered an inauspicious planet, even though from a theological point of view, the sun is sometimes worshipped as Brahman. He is a superimposition on Brahman, like everything else in the, in the apparent creation. So, this is the mood which is coming in. I am being burnt by these three miseries. What are they? Adiatmic, miseries self-created, mostly by the mind. Adidaivic, miseries created by the gods, in other words, from karma. And adibotic. Adibotic means coming from nature like storms and mosquitoes and, you know, all the little inconveniences of life, like birth and death, you know. But anyway, these miseries, these threefold miseries, are the source of the motivation for liberation. In a way, they're mercy, because if everything was nice in the material world, there would be no impetus to get out, and one could go on in illusion forever. So to safeguard against that, Maya certainly makes everyone in this world suffer. And to be uh, in anxiety, seeing the life slip away day by day, tick-tock, tick-tock, uh, by the influence of time, everything is burnt up and worn down, used up and destroyed in the end. So he begs the teacher. He's saying, actually, even though I have all the qualifications to be a spiritual student, I still don't have that ultimate knowledge, that knowledge knowing which there is nothing further to be known. So you please give me that knowledge as succinctly and as in a concentrated way as possible. And therefore, I shall use this knowledge to realize Brahman and free myself from the trap, as he says, of bondage to change. Huh? That sun rising and setting every day, taking away the life one by one, one day at a time, until there's nothing left. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.